We are now going to start uh, our next panel, and this session will focus on reforming scientific publishing, but toward a specific outcome, and that is the Global Science Commons for the SDGs. Uh, this is really exciting because we've been talking about uh, open science in the context of what it can do to help achieve the SDGs, and certainly um, creating some sort of a space where open science can come together and help contribute toward further action on the SDGs would be um, really a, a momentous step toward making that connection and strengthening the science policy society interface to support the SDGs. So I'm pleased to introduce the moderator for this, sec this uh, session, Ms. Heather Joseph the executive director of SPARC, um, which is the Scholarly Publishing and Academic Resources Coalition. And Heather's been a, a um, familiar face in the open science conferences with the, the leadership that SPARC has been taking in the, the movement toward um, open science and, and scientific scholarship. Uh, SPARC's long supported the open and equitable sharing of digital articles, data, and educational resources. Um, Heather herself has been very involved in the convening the Alliance for Taxpayer Access and the Open Access Working Group, which provided critical advocacy toward establishing um, some landmark achievements, the 2008 uh, National Institute of Health Public Access Policy and the 2013 White House Memorandum on Public Access to Federally Funded Research, which took place in the United States. Uh, so Heather, I turn it over to you to um, steer the panelists through this session. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to uh, have the privilege of moderating this final session. I want to thank the organizers of this conference once again for an incredibly rich three days um, of discussion. Uh, the push, as we all know, for faster, wider, and more equitable knowledge sharing has really taken on a new urgency since uh, this conference series started um, in 2019 um, uh, with the uh, events, in including the global pandemic and just the rapidly accelerating climate crisis, really providing us a backdrop that has compelled us all to push ever harder for um, faster action. Um, our keynote speakers set the stage for this final uh, discussion um, in a beautiful way by painting a compelling and sweeping picture of the scope of both the sweeping challenges that are in front of us, as well as the unavoidable imperative for us to, to be poised to take action. Um, uh, from Shamila's opening chemo, uh, keynote, that centered open science as an act of solidarity in pursuit of social justice to Ariana's eloquent discussion of epistemic justice and the dangers of caging knowledge in an industry of prestige to Allison's wonderful uh, talk this morning, which was so candid and pragmatic uh, in an, its examination of the need for top to bottom reform, systemic reform, from resetting how we behave and our culture chain, the culture change that's needing, needed to moving beyond a market environment for knowledge. With all those talks and the talks uh, that were contributed in between, we were reminded of the fundamental thing that brought us all together here, that sharing knowledge is a human right, that it's critical to the successful realization of all of the SDGs, which universally depend on the free flow of knowledge across geographic, political, and socioeconomic borders. But we've also been reminded again and again over the past three days that the global record of science and scholarship is by no means yet open and available to all. Our speakers over the past three days have reinforced this. And in previous panels, we've seen um, them drilling really deeply into the details of challenges that we face as we, use, as we work to use open as an enabling strategy to both deconstruct the current limited inequitable system and to actively design and construct a system that better serves the needs of humanity by recentering knowledge where it belongs as a global public good. And as we've heard, this requires massive systemic change throughout the global research and education enterprise. It requires, as other sessions have covered, deconstructing the scholarly and scientific communication process, moving away from just depending on the article as a single static currency and moving towards a much more dynamic system of communi continuous communication 
comprised of diverse research outputs. It also requires that the incentives and rewards that underpin this scientific knowledge sharing system be completely revamped to support a more dynamic and equitable system. It requires dismantling the financial models that have turned knowledge into a commodity and requiring and it requires reimagining new mechanisms that more appropriately, inclusively, and equitably support both knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. And as what we'll hear uh, now in this panel, it also requires moving away from the current way we collectively approach the critical infrastructure that underpins, underpins knowledge sharing and abandoning si siloed proprietary exclusionary approaches for models that operate and interoperate locally, regionally, and globally. So in this session, we'll hear from three wonderful experts uh, who, are leading pioneer, who are leading pioneering initiatives in open science, regional open science cloud initiatives, as well as a voice from an organization that represents the global voice of scientists addressing issues of major concern to science and society. And we'll really hear about uh, the large challenges and opportunities on the infrastructure front that we have in generating greater access to scientific knowledge and data. So in keeping with the flow of the previous sessions, each panelist will have about 10 to 12 minutes for their remarks. Uh, followed by questions from the audience. If you are following us online, please just type your questions into uh, the Q&A sidebar, and in-person members will recognize you uh, from the floor. Our first speaker, I will introduce each in turn, uh, and our first speaker is Kathleen Shearer, who is the Executive Director of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, or CORE. Uh, CORE, for those of you who don't know, you should know CORE, it is a fantastic international association with members and partners from around the world uh, that work to bring together individual repositories and repository networks um, in order to build capacity, align policies and practices, and to act as a global voice for the repository community. Kathleen has been working to promote inclusive open access and open science for over 20 years. She's a leading expert in the global, in global open infrastructure and is actively engaged with numerous organizations and initiatives around the world, helping to advance the vision of a science commons. Kathleen. Thank you uh, so much, Heather. And um, it's just a great honor and pleasure to be here, um, especially on International Day of Women and Girls in Science. And uh, from the makeup of this room, I think there are a lot of women and girls in open science as well, because <laughs> we have a really good turnout of women here. Um, I'd like to especially thank um, United Nations Library and UNESCO for taking up this very important issue and putting a spotlight on it and giving it the visibility it, it deserves. So um, being on the final a panel brings with it some challenges, um, and that's to try to say something that hasn't already been said. <laughs> so I'll do my best to do that. But it also means that we, we are the ones who are able to have the final say, right? So um, it really is undeniable um, that research and scholarship have made a huge contribution to human welfare. Um, we've talked about a number of discoveries already over the past three days, but we can point to insulin, antibiotics, CRISPR technology, machine learning, nuclear fusion, mRNA vaccines, and, and so on. So in principle, science and scholarship really should play a large role in helping us to reach the sustainable development goals. But as noted um, at this multi-stakeholder forum that was held in May last year, actually here at the United Nations, although science may be our best bet for achieving the SDGs, we first need to ensure that the outcomes of science are distributed more equitably. So really, I mean, to maximize the impact of science, it cannot remain in the ivory tower. That's what the SDGs are about. The SDGs are about applying and using science in our everyday world and our, our societies. It cannot remain with only well-resourced institutions. And there are actually many barriers, um, and we talked about a few of them yesterday to, make, to making research more usable and action, actionable, but fundamentally, it does have to be accessible, and it has to be relevant. 
Um, and one of the big issues that I'd like to take a few moments to discuss is the issue of language. And researchers, of course, we've heard over the last three days that researchers everywhere are evaluated on their ability to publish in international, high prestige journals that are usually published in English. But according to the Helsinki Initiative um, on Multilingualism, the disqualification of local and national languages and academia is actually the most important factor that prevents societies from actually using and taking advantage of local research. So this is incredibly important. And it's really because our academic incentive system is not aligned with our social uh, priorities and goals. Ideally, we want a system that um, supports and shares all valuable research outputs that rapidly shares those research outputs um, with the community through preprints, that has open peer review connected to those preprints, that we have a public infrastructure for the dissemination of research with no transaction fees for authors or readers, that we have a distributed ecosystem to be able to support the bibliodiversity that we know we need in an international and global research ecosystem, to have open content so we can support artificial intelligence and text and data mining, and to utilize the potential of the open web. This is what I call a universally, universal quality controlled research communication system. But what we really have now is predominantly pay to access or pay to publish scholarly publishing system. The focus is on the article. There are very lengthy lag times from submission to publication. There are excessively high pay-to-access fees and pay-to-publish fees now. Um, there's consolidation and centralization of infrastructure, publishing infrastructure. There are closed collections and silos. And there are, is a print legacy system that has not changed even in the digital world. So while open science was supposed to democratize knowledge, and the knowledge production system, it has been for the most far, part so far maintaining the, the inequities of the subscription-based system. And this is um, very unfortunate because the opportunity is huge in terms of what we can do in the digital environment. And again, I think this really hinges on the fact that it's the academic incentive system that drives, is driving this, um, and as well as where we are directing our resources. Um, there is a lot of money in the system, but it's all going in one direction, and it, it needs to be dispersed. And of course, there are very powerful entrenched interests, commercial interests, to keep it this way. So my question in this context is, can we really reform the current system to bring about the changes that we need? Or do we need to create a whole new system and build something different. So um, to maximize the impact of research, I believe, strongly believe that we need to move away from the commodification of research knowledge. And at core, um, our vision is to create a global knowledge commons. Um, and the concept of the commons really is uh, one where resources are accessible to all members of society and they're managed for the individual and collective benefit, sort of like air or water. And that's the same way I believe we should be managing our uh, research outputs and the global knowledge commons. And at core, we believe this knowledge commons can be built on a global network of repositories on top of which value, uh, layers of value-added services can be deployed. And we really see this commons as, as critical for supporting not only open access to content, um, but also to supporting text and data mining and the kind of research that will need to be done and that we want to support in the future. So there are already thousands of repositories around the world. Um, they're mostly hosted by libraries, universities, and research centers. But they, are, they tend to be somewhat under-resourced, I would say, and they have rather low visibility. 
And so at CORE, we're really trying to change this uh, perception of repositories by, on the one hand, well, we're doing a lot of things, but on the one hand, um, we're working with regional and national partners, including Spark, by the way, to really strengthen and catalyze national repository networks and regional repository networks in order to raise their visibility and improve their functionality. And on the other hand, we are trying to advance innovation in this space. And we're trying to advance some innovation that is really um, not in the interest necessarily of others to advance, or they cannot um, do that. And that's what I'd like to uh, talk about. Oh, here's the Global Knowledge Commons. Um, so um, we are very, very grateful to the Arcadia Foundation for some funding that we have received over the next four years to advance the core Notify initiative. And we see this as um, a really important technological um, next step for creating that global knowledge and linked ecosystem that we really need to move forward. Um, this is using well-established uh, W3C standards to, um, to um, uh, support linking related content across the ecosystem. And it will create the kind of um, cohesive and interlinked ecosystem that Lisa is, was, was talking about earlier without having to aggregate metadata from various siloed um, repositories and so on. And our first effort around advancing the Notify initiative is to connect peer prints with open peer review and overlay peer review services. So we're really trying to move forward this um, uh, uh, publish and then review model, which um, will allow content to be deposited in preprint services rapidly and then have the trusted peer review connected with that over time. And really, it's, it's, it's about decoupling the, the publishing process. It's about creating uh, an ecosystem that um, supports sharing of, knowledge, of, of research data as well as articles and other types of research output and um, enabling those uh, many valuable research outputs to be connected with each other. So we are, are not on this journey alone. Um, we have a number of uh, partners who are already at the vanguard of developing these new type of services. And we're very pleased to be working with them to, um, to push forward and advance this new vision. So in conclusion, um, research knowledge, we believe, should be treated as a public good, not a commodity. It's too important to be shut behind paywalls, and it's too important to be subject to publishing fees. So thank you very much, and I look forward to hearing the other panelists. Thank you so much, Kathleen. That was um, a very compelling vision of a distributed system that can work uh, um, much better than the system that we currently have in place. Um, our second speaker is, uh, Dr. Tiamo, Mo, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> Dr. Tiamo Mochegua, um, who serves as the director of the African, <clears throat> pardon me, the African Open Science Platform, which aims to position African scientists at the cutting edge of data-intensive science, and to engage the global commons to address continental and global challenges through joint action. Um, he's been very active on the national, regional, and global level. On the national level. Uh, he has served um, in the Ministry of Tertiary Education Research, Science and Technology in, Bet in Botswana around the Smart Botswana National Digital uh, 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 Transformation Initiative um, regarding education towards a knowledge economy, which targeted the digital transformation of research, science, technology, and innovation. Regionally, he's chaired the Southern African Development Committee of the Technical Experts Working Group working on um, cyber infrastructure framework to develop a regional, a regional commons um, of computing networks, uh, data, and skills. And globally, he's a member of the Open Science Cloud's executive roundtable, uh, promoting collaboration through open science and practice towards optimal global interoperability. The floor is yours, Tiama. Thank you. I think I should have taken some of the time to, to do the actual presentation instead of the long elaborate 
biography, but but very very very. I didn't very, want to leave anything out because <laughs> it's very impressive. Colleagues, it's such a great pleasure uh, to be here at the UN. First of all, maybe just to thank Anathius Janakopoulos. I think I pronounced that rather well. <laughs> I've had very good friends, Greek friends, and I have to say also Turkish friends. And I think that honed my diplomatic skills when I was a PhD student <laughs> some years ago. And also just to thank the organizers for this very, very robust program you have that you've convened us today to, in the previous few days, to, to deliberate over. And indeed, it's not just about open access. Open access is just one of the pillars, very important pillars of that. And also appreciating the audience and the delegates, the librarians here, very, very important stakeholder uh, in this particular conversation. And also to appreciate the work that UNESCO is doing, particularly Anna and her team, that I've had the pleasure of engaging with for the past few months. Particularly, we enjoyed a rather successful conference in South Africa at the World Science Forum. Uh, where African Open Science Platform and UNESCO organized a Open Science Day, which I think was very, very impactful. I think this brings me to the number of conferences we have uh, on these themes and the need to weave the conversations and knit them together so that we make progressive, incremental, actionable steps as we go forward. Uh, prior to the Science Forum, we were in Dallas at the Supercomputing Conference, big conference on the infrastructure side of things. Uh, prior to that, we were in ICRI in Brno, uh, Czech Republic, where there was a very profound declaration on how research infrastructures uh, can collaborate. I think that was very profound. Policymakers were there, and they made these pronouncements. And after that, we were hosted by Professor Brand Mons. We had the opportunity to listen to him the other day. He hosted the first Fair Digital Objects a conference, which I thought was also a very profound. Uh, prior to that, we were in Trieste in Italy at the Enran conferences uh, in Europe. And subsequent to that, we were also in Botswana, hosting the Enrans, discussing how they can support open science. So I would like to see a dispensation where these conversations progress. And also, we have actionable outcomes that we can build upon. So I thought I'll just transgress a little bit. But also appreciating United Nations uh, for hosting this. We had a very good tour yesterday of the UN building, I think we got to a wall where it talked about the, the rights, the human rights. I wasn't aware that there was this elaborate. I don't think I remember some of them. And I wrote some of them here that are maybe pertinent to what we're discussing. The right to enjoy the benefit of science. The right of authors uh, to, to moral and material interest from their works. Freedom to undertake scientific research and creative activity. I think this is very relevant. And of course, there were other rights that I wasn't aware of. Everyone has the right to rest and leisure, including reasonable, uh, limited working hours, periodic holidays with pay, which I think has got implications for, 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 for employers. Colleagues, it really gives me great pleasure today to come and share with you some of the efforts that we are doing the continent uh, particularly this tantalizing prospects of developing a Pan-African platform uh, to really perpetuate what we've been discussing and other aspects of open science. Uh, this initiative is hosted for Africa by South Africa. Uh, Dr. Aldo Strobel is here from NRF. Uh, the modality is that there will be a coordinating office in South Africa that will work in tandem with the regional nodes in different parts of the continent. And I have to say, uh, uh, the pillars that we talked about this week, i.e. open access, is just one of the number of pillars. And there are others that I really wanted to, to make sure uh, that uh, maybe with this presentation I, 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 I share. Uh, we're also very grateful to the International Science Council. Dr. Matthew is here, a very, very important partner to this initiative uh, now and in the future. And I think this is very critical for us to make sure that these partnerships are explored uh, and, 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 and used. Colleagues, the issue of policy was discussed in a session uh, the other day. I think that's a very, very detailed one, a very, very important one. Uh, from the top approach, we need to make sure that we've got the skeletal uh, framework uh, for policy. Policy not only that uh, talks to how we do things, but also it's interoperable. We have policy frameworks that talks to each other. 
And I think it's very, very critical given that we also had that there's a Open Science 101 course uh, that maybe think about that course in terms of all levels. The policymakers need their 101 course, uh, the researchers need their 101 course, uh, and everybody else for that matter. The issue of infrastructure is critical, colleagues. Uh, Africa can benefit from accessible infrastructure. We know how the continent has, has missed the various uh, different uh, uh, revolutions. Before it was the migration of people with, with forced labor. Now it's voluntary migration of people because they cannot do science in the continent. They're going somewhere called brain drain. And infrastructure is a key one uh, that we need to think about. The issue of data is the, another elephant in the room. We had elephants before, this is a big one. And I think it's also a key issue that in the continent we need to think about. Of course, colleagues, the issue of these collaborations that we need to build to make sure uh, that we work in tandem in joint action, partnerships. So I'm here. Uh, to come and engage you yourselves in all your endeavors to make sure that we find synergies uh, we, where we can work together. Uh, pretty much this is my presentation. Maybe I should stop here, uh, but maybe not. Um, I want to run through a number of slides, colleagues. Africa is a large continent, as you know. It's always mind-boggling every time I see this slide. I don't know whether my geography was not uh, taught properly. You can fit the world in Africa. And I think this is profound because it provides us with the opportunities and challenges that we need to think about. Uh, on the opportunity side, we see Africa as the continent that is a sleeping giant uh, that has to be woken up. Indeed, there are visions that capture what we need to do. The Agenda 2063 is particularly relevant, uh, but it also unpacks, obviously, the different pillars, the different challenges that we need to address, and also the obligations that we need to address as far as Africa is concerned to the world. The challenges, colleagues, are multifaceted, they are interlinked, they transcend boundaries, and cannot be addressed by singular governments. I think this calls for open science diplomacy, for science diplomacy, so that we work together on these things. There are some very good instruments uh, that try to uh, use or disarticulate how science can be the conduit to solving some of these challenges. TISA 2024 particularly is a very profound document that talks about you know, science and how it can be used as a vehicle uh, for addressing some of these challenges. There's the African Digital Transformation Strategy that also articulates how Africa, through digital transformation, uh, can advance. And of course, all this is about livelihoods. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is particularly very, very important instruments uh, that we need to think about. And again, in terms of open science, now that we are here, we talked about open access. The value proposition for open science, I think, has to be articulated. Uh, the policymakers need to appreciate why they need to think about these investments you're talking about. The public needs to appreciate why open science. So really, I think there's some fantastic work that provides us a very good basis for really building this value proposition. The efficiency gains for using open science, I think that clear, especially for countries, uh, for regions where resources are constraints, uh, to make sure that we harness the investments that we've made. And again, the trajectory now is for developing platforms uh, for supporting open science. I think a lot of uh, discussions were had about how COVID uh, facilitated or at least made sure that we engage collectively. And open science platforms have been key to that. There's good discussions, colleagues, about developing a global open science platform that will allow us to work together in joint action, including for solving intractable problems that we all know that the world faces the issue of sustainable goals, the issues of climate change. These are areas we need to collaborate, not compete in. And indeed, at the regional level, regions in Europe and elsewhere are developing these platforms. And indeed, that's why, as Africa, we believe it's important to have a platform that can plug into the international dispensation to allow us to act uh, collectively. Indeed, on the bottom, bottom left, you see what we need to do. We need to develop these ecosystems that provides connectivity, provides computational platforms, uh, allows us to share instruments, very expensive instruments at that. Investments have gone in. That will also allow us to find out who is doing what in terms of expertise. When I'm doing a proposal as a scientist, it would be very useful to know who are the other experts in the continent working on these things. Uh, colleagues, I think the issue of, of, of um, investments in terms of software, for example, or in terms of access to databases, these things can be procured uh, through creating critical masses of institutions that can pool their resources. So really it's a very key one, this issue of cyber infrastructure. And again, colleagues, uh, maybe Anathius uh, and, and the chair, chair, chairperson just indulging me a little bit here. 
um, open science provides an opportunity for Africa. I thought maybe this slide will capture this. Africa is a young continent. Uh, we've got a very good opportunity to train the upcoming young scientists properly uh, in terms of how to do science in the foreseeable future. Uh, the issue of very good cutting edge science happening in the continent. Uh, Dr. Aldo Strobel we mentioned that NRF hosts uh, one of the national facilities that will be hosting the Square Kilometer Array, the biggest science project ever, even bigger than the Hadron Collider uh, projects. Colleagues, this gives us an opportunity to use this project as a conduit to perpetuating what we're discussing today in terms of open science. Uh, the issue of biodiversity, we all know the planet is very fragile. We had a very good presentation from NASA. I'm showing you there the diagram that shows the Okavango Delta from space, one of the World Heritage Sites, UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Uh, the biodiversity there and the science that needs to be performed uh, to make sure that we preserve uh, that biodiversity is critical. And of course, as a resource rich continent, uh, the next big mines can be uh, discovered through the use of uh, shared data, through the use of, of open science and others. So I really wanted to, to maybe highlight that slide uh, to show where we are. And again, colleagues, just to reflect on what we think in the continent are imperatives. And I think this has been discussed. I thought maybe just to, co to contribute to the discussion, we all agree that science is an important conduit uh, to, to transformational change. And I think the issue of putting society at the core is also very important. Um, our societies are different. The dialogue we need to have with our societies are different. We need as a continent to make sure that we have that dialogue with our communities. And I think it's very, very critical to make sure we also reflect on whether our systems are fit for purpose. Um, the issue of open science and its impact uh, has to be looked into. Where is the impact framework for open science? What are the impact dimensions? Have we scrutinized those as far as our jurisdictions are concerned? And I think for Africa, what is also critical, like elsewhere, is the issue of making sure that our research agenda in the continent, in as much as it addresses uh, continental challenges, it must allow us to collaborate together. And there are issues that I'm highlighting some of those images uh, on the right-hand side uh, regarding doing science in the continent, uh, making sure that the scientific work coming out of the continent reflects all the actors that contributed to it. I think it's very critical uh, to colleagues to, 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 to highlight that. And then maybe contributing to the discussions that were had today on, on access to knowledge. I think I've heard some of the comments in the early uh, sessions uh, on Monday, on Tuesday, regarding democratizing science, regarding uh, 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 access to, to, to literature, regarding dialogue uh, between knowledge systems. I enjoyed uh, the presentation by Professor Kajet, I think, uh, on indigenous knowledge. And I think this is very critical for us. Uh, where are the indigenous knowledge systems that uh, record indigenous knowledge uh, in various communities? Where is the legislation that uh, provides pronouncements what IKS is and how it needs to be treated? And how we, have, we, have, we, have we developed uh, 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 centers of excellence around these areas? I think these are key areas. And of course, the dialogue about how to transform this, this system, uh, how can Africa uh, obviously co contribute uh, to that debate. Um, very, very quickly, another elephant in the room, we talked about data. Um, I really wanted to share this slide because let's not forget the citizenry and whether they are ably and capably contributing and participating with the data that is being collected about them. The issue of data citizenship and data literacy, very, very critical. We mentioned the issue of data stewardship and the data values. You know, really seeing data as the route to inclusion and equity, data that is well governed and data that powers sustainable development. There are some very good works uh, that are done. Colleagues, maybe lastly there, just to show that it's very, very critical that we facilitate and are very clear about articulating what the roles of all the role uh, players are. Um, let's educate our governments, uh, have them as champions of open science, uh, motivate uh, that they provide the necessary investments. Uh, it's easier said than done, but I think it's very important for us to communicate uh, these things uh, to them um, amongst uh, the various uh, 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 um, uh, 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 things their way. Universities, maybe sometimes not all about resources. What about the configurations? Our universities are configured properly to be able to, to be fit for purpose. Uh, very quickly, I can see uh, 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 my chair lady there reminding me of time. Amongst all the things I talked about, there is a lot of activity in the continent and, 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 and landscapes that was done to reflect on all this. And this led to us developing the strategy that I really wanted to share with you today and its various pillars among the things I've discussed. We are sharing this strategy because now we're in the execution mode. We want to make sure that we execute all these things. And we need partners 
uh, to allow us to be able to be successful. I've mentioned the issue of infrastructure, uh, the issue of these networks that we need to make sure that we create uh, the ecosystem for, for example, sharing uh, 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 education uh, uh, interventions, uh, uh, making sure that you can also engage, engage society. I also wanted to maybe very quickly, uh, in that one minute that is left, highlight that the problems that we're going to solve have to emanate from the policies and the policies that were developed uh, in the various countries. We cannot dream up these problems. These problems have to be emanating from those platforms, from those policies to make sure uh, that uh, we address societal challenges. And indeed, there has been some discussions uh, through ASP and other regional bodies in terms of how we can plug in. To bring real elephants in the room, we need these big projects. Projects that will allow us to solve problems through open science. These are real projects that affect people on the ground. You cannot have an elephant in your back garden in, in, in Africa without thinking about how you interact with these animals. The issue of the biodiversity, the issue of the scientific instruments we need, the issue of joint projects that we need to work together as a continent. Genomics, Africa is the most diverse, genomically, genetically diverse continent, linguistically diverse. Are we bringing science to the fore to be able to make sure that we address all these challenges? Colleagues, as I, as I conclude, uh, we are here to say the African Open Science Platform is taking its baby steps. I want you to join us in executing this strategy uh, across all the pillars. We want to talk to all of you uh, to make sure that uh, you can see how you can plug in and work with this partnership. I'm providing there a very good summary of where we are today uh, and in terms of what you need to go forward. I also maybe took a minute, uh, Chairman Taylady, to to provide some points regarding this particular topic of open access. And I think let's not forget uh, society. Let's maybe not just focus on open access as peer-to-peer -peer information between scientists. Let's think about how we're communicating the findings of research with society in a language that they understand. The issue of uh, scientific communication for public and policy engagement is critical. Let's also think about um, how we communicate back the results to them, having done all those public health uh, research that we know uh, they are part of. I think I'll stop there. I'll provide all the slides in terms of information summary. Uh, I have provided a very detailed value proposition of Open Science Platform and Open Science that I'll really share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jamo. I think you wrapped it up on the perfect note of reminding us that it all comes back to pub not just public engagement, but public good. Um, thank you. Our final speaker in the panel um, is Dr. Mathieu Denis, who currently serves as Senior Director and Head of um, the International Science Council's new Center for um, uh, Science Futures, which is a think tank that provides thought leadership in discussions of policy for science, and that aims to provide the evidence and intellectual resources that can help transform science and research systems at the global and, and regional levels. Before heading the center, uh, Dr. Dennis served as the science director at the ISC, a position that he held from the founding of that organization through 2022. And I think it's really interesting to know that uh, he also served as acting CEO of the ISC throughout last year. And as many of you may know or may not know, he played a critical um, role in the 1920, of the 1920, how old am I? The 2018 <laughs> uh, merger that resulted in the establishment of uh, the ISC, which now brings together more than 220 um, organizations worldwide, including international science unions, uh, associations from natural social sciences, the humanities, life sciences, as well as national and regional scientific organizations like academies of science and research councils. Uh, Dr. Dennis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Heather, for this um, very generous introduction. One thing uh, is clear, uh, I'm not a librarian, I'll, I'll, uh, but I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be uh, invited and to participate in this important discussion. I must start with an apology because I arrived about half an hour ago, so I've missed most of the discussions. Um, and I'm also the last one to speak, which, which I guess increases the, 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 the likelihood that I will repeat things that you've heard. Uh, a lot over the past the past few days. I'll try. I'll do my best to try and come up with new things. But if I don't, I won't have any way of knowing. Um, so, the ISC. Thank you, Heather, for uh, giving a sense to the audience of what the International Science Council is. I don't take for granted that people know it is the world's largest non-governmental 
organization representing science. It has members indeed in about 140 something countries, uh, and it represents the disciplines uh, from the natural to the human and, so, and so social sciences. Um, and for the past five years, roughly, the Council has been putting a lot of effort in trying to rethink uh, or think through the future of scientific publishing, rethink the ways in which uh, scientific publishing should evolve, should be transformed, but doing that in articulating uh, principles from the perspective of scientists. So we, we know, you know at least, uh, what librarians think about that. We know what the industry, the publishers themselves, think about the future of their industry. We certainly know by now, have a better idea of what the public funders in many parts of the world think about the future of, of scientific publishing. The ISC tries to articulate, has articulated, uh, 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 a vision of how scientific publishing should evolve, but really try and take the, the, the position of scientists. So this particular session now, I've, I've been asked to reflect on the future of scientific publishing, but also with a focus on open, on open access. <clears throat> now, I don't need to convince we're all converted. We don't need to you know, convince ourselves of how important open access is. Uh, so let me just maybe start by um, stating, uh, saying once again that there's, we're, seeing, we're seeing an important acceleration of open access, obviously. I'm sure it has been mentioned many times over the past few days. Uh, since 2019, over 50% of the total share of scientific outputs are in open access. Uh, and since 20, 20, 2021, 75, three quarters of that share are go in golden access. Uh, it is very likely that this percentage will continue to increase. Look at what's, you know, we all have in mind the recent positions that the United States country we're in at the moment took recently. We're, I'm sure, all aware of the position defended by the European Commission and reinforced by several European countries. China is also making big steps uh, in that direction. So this is a percentage that's likely to increase. Of course, issues remain. Previous panel have mentioned several. Uh, uh, Kathleen, you've just mentioned a few. Uh, again, we need to be very cautious about the transfer of the cost of publishing uh, to the author, from subscription to the author. Very important. We need to remain very vigilant about access to, uh, to journals and the scientific uh, record. Tiamo, you've just, you've just uh, been very eloquent about that. Yet, there's a strong movement that seems very hard to stop at the moment. Vigilance, yes, but there's something, you know, we need to be, we need to be proud of what we're, we're seeing at the moment. Even from the industry, I think there's a, broad, there's a, a broader recognition that open access, for example, in low and lower middle income country is absolutely central. They've put in place certain mechanisms that recognize, that recognize the importance of that. So there's this acceleration of open access, which, is, which cannot be denied. Open access and that acceleration comes with a conventional discourse, a standard discourse, which we've, I've heard a little bit again um, here. It says, for example, that um, of course open access serves people, serves governments or societies, uh, uh, making informed, uh, better, therefore better decisions because it allows free access to, to knowledge, the knowledge that's, that is most relevant to them. <clears throat> and in particular, it serves government in low and lower income countries, accessing uh, knowledge which otherwise might be difficult. Uh, and it's critical for the achievement of the SDGs, right? Where, I mean, we've, that's, that's, that's a discourse that, that, that we hear a lot, and of course there's something to it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think we're seeing yet any correlation between open access and achievement of SDGs, for example. So I think, you know, while that discourse is, is there and has something to it, I think we, especially in a context like this one, need not be naive about, about it and, and be aware or be, uh, um, 
accept the fact that if we take, if we wanted to think seriously about the future of scientific publishing, there are s important issues that are not going to be addressed with open access. I've heard some of, you know, some elements have been, men have been mentioned already, uh, uh, but, uh, but that's, that's, where, that's where I want to take us, take that discussion a little bit. It's asking us to, you know, just a little st step a little bit aside from uh, the discussions we've I think you've had uh, thus far, and try and look at the, the, the big issues for scientific publishing uh, and take the perspective of scientists in particular and try and, and identify possibly, hopefully, certain, certain um, answers. So the first one, and that is a major issue, is, has to do with quality control. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure who is in, who's in, in the room, but between librarians, I'm seeing uh, people who are funding research. I'm seeing people who are doing um, policy at national, international uh, level. We have tremendous issues with quality controls uh, in the scientific publishing industry at the moment. Currently, you, may, you probably know these numbers. We count, roughly speaking, 30,000 journals in the world are publishing 4.7 million articles a year. Estimates, or best estimates, are that 50% of those journals uh, do not do any form of meaningful peer review at all. And peer review is the one quality control that we have for journals. That's the one. Uh, and so with 50% of, of those journals not doing any meaningful um, um, peer review, what, we're, what, we, what we have is a significant share of journals that have been created um, to serve the willingness of people to publish articles uh, and their readiness to pay. And that is, that, is a significant, that is a significant issue, as you can imagine. Peer review, uh, estimates are that peer review represents 15,000 hours of, of unpaid work uh, at the global level. It is, it, is, it is estimate that it represents, you know, billions of dollars in inv investment uh, that are, that go, into, that go into peer review. And yet, when tested, when peer review is tested, when people um, try and replicate, reproduce, publish articles with mistakes in them, um, we realize that there's approximately, across the board, 30% of the mistakes that are caught by peer review. We're seeing retractions of articles increasing. Now, of course, you could say retractions are a good thing. They show you that at least after publication, there's some sort of quality control mechanism that come into play and that allow retract retraction, and that's, that is Correct, but I would, I would argue only to an extent. Because higher level of retraction, also the, the lower probably the trust in the peer review uh, is as well. And, and you know, but in, in discussions with colleagues, you will see that some people do trust peer review and some others have a lot of, of criticism and have doubt. And so, and so, uh, and when we, we have studies on whether or not people trust the reviews. Some say yes, some say no. So I think I think it's um, uh, you know you have we have a little bit of both. Uh, there are indications as well that the the global quality of what gets published is diminishing. Now this is very difficult to measure, of course, but we're all aware of that the 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 topics of articles are have got very narrow over the past two or three decades, or we probably all have all heard of the smallish, the smallest publishable unit. So the idea that art, you know, you publish as much as possible, uh, which explains the 4.7 million articles published a year. But at the same time, <clears throat> you may have seen uh, articles recently in Nature and elsewhere about the, 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 the <laughs> fact that truly disruptive studies are declining rapidly. 
we have other, other indicators. They're all proxies, right? They're all proxies, but indicators, for instance, that the Moore's, Moore's Law uh, takes now 18 times more investment in research to, uh, to, to, to continue to be, uh, to be uh, uh, observed than, uh, than uh, 30 years ago. So there are indications that the, the, uh, uh, the global quality of what gets published may not, be, uh, may not be increasing, to put it mildly. And paradoxically, uh, the, the use of words like innovative, groundbreaking, novel, all of that in abstracts has increased ninefold over the past 30 years. It was, and I saw an article, someone made the, uh, just you know, pursued the curve of the use of the word novel in abstracts and predicted that within 100 years, so in, by 21, 23, it will be used in 100% of abstracts. So, <laughs> So, so that's, the first, that's the first element that I wanted to mention. First issue, quality control, which is not, direct, not going to be directly addressed by open access. The second one has to do with data. Now, Heather, you, you've said a lot about data, um, so I don't need to repeat that. What's important is that data, in principle, is as important as the article. So we do need access to data. Yet too often, the research data is either not provided with the article, not usable, um, and sometimes doesn't even exist. Uh, so there's, there's some, some serious uh, work that needs to be done around data, around the access to data and the use, the use of data. Um, because retraction is one thing, but a, a finding that cannot be reproduced or cannot be replicated for lack of information, for lack of data, that's even worse in a way, right? Um, the third aspect, and that's the final one, is that the whole system now is increasingly questioned by advances in artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and since a few weeks now with, with, with uh, chat, chat, chat bots, Chat GPT, we're seeing a lot of institutions getting really anxious, a lot of journals getting really anxious about both the production of articles and peer review. Um, other people saying, well, you know what, actually, you know, it's great because that's also the way in which we're going to be able to track fraud more easily, right? So, so there's something there. So some, some see it as a, as a threat, some see it as a, as a solution, but there is something there that we really need to address together, and again, uh, peer review is not, is certainly not the, the answer. Responses, should I go into responses, or do you want me to, if I can do that. one or two key points you want I to make, can, and then we can go to Q&A, and I can, do a, a, a little wrap up right at the end. Very good, thank you, thank you for this. I'll, just a few, a few points about possible, possible solution, possible solu uh, uh, responses. Um, there, so for the peer review system, we need to review it all. So I'm, I'm taking your, your, your language here, um, um, Kathleen, about you know, this needs a transformation. We need to strengthen the considerations of replicability and reproducibility during the peer review phase. Uh, we, journals need to invite studies that replicate and reproduce uh, articles that they have published. This is absolutely critical. Uh, we need to uh, open much more th the process of peer review, so open peer review, post-publication post peer review, and here the Latin Americans probably are showing the way, and we need to get inspired by the work that they've done, that they've done here. When it comes to data, we need encompassing policies for data access and use. Metadata that was also mentioned in the previous panel is critical, uh, absolutely critical, and we need journal policy. So journal editors here, we need journal policies on how to deal with uh, 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 complex data sets, with articles that are crossing complex data sets from third party. Not every scientist in the world produces their own data sets. We need to have clear policies for, 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 for crossing data sets. Um, and we need to test together AI in machine learning, we need, we, need data mine, we need to be able to do data minings, but we need to learn more. 
the final message is that we're not going to be able to transform or get the, 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 the new type of scientific publishing that we want without the participation of everyone. We'll need the, we, we, we need, certainly need the scientists, we certainly need the funders, we need the governments, we need some strong will from governments, and we do need the publishers around the table, and we need to work together to find, to find the best solution. Thank you very much. Thank you to all three panelists for your um, uh, contributions. Um, we'll open up the, the floor to questions here. We do have a couple that have come in over the chat. Um, one that I will just, just start with, which um, uh, Kathleen, it's addressed to you. And first and foremost, there is a heartfelt thank you for the brilliant work that you and CORE have been doing in terms of uh, building this connected network of repositories. Uh, this is coming from uh, Susan Murray, who is one of our presenters uh, from AJOL in a previous session. And she's wondering about uh, subject specialist curation for specific areas of research. And uh, does that play a role on top of the ideal system of connected repositories? And could that be the new kind of following up on another theme that we uh, have discussed in, in previous sessions? Can that concept be the new journal of communities of research in the future? And what your thoughts are on that? Uh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, I, I do think curation is a very important issue. And um, one of the reasons why maybe repositories are um, less visible than they, they should be is because of the issue of, of curation and the lack of resources going towards curation of the content. And um, I completely agree with you, Susan, that, um, you know, connecting open peer review with content that's curated properly, uh, uh, you know, with an article and connected to the underlying research data really should be the future of scholarly um, communications moving forward. So the question is really how to move from the system that we're in now to, to a system that supports this kind of interlinked and open um, uh, research communications. It, this this concept of moving to a new system, you know, whether is it dismantling the, the, the current system that we have, you know, do we operate in the flawed system for as long as we can while we're building the new system alongside, you know, is one that I think all of you have, have been exploring from different perspectives. And um, Atiyama, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on whether this is, we're operating in a parallel universe for the foreseeable future, whether you see you know, the, the systems that we're replacing just sort of slowly eroding the, the, the current players. And um, the two you closed with the, um, I'm sure, somewhat controversial comment that like all players need to stay in the system if I'm interpreting you correctly. So maybe Tiamu, you can comment first and Matu, you second. I think we have a great opportunity. Somebody was saying something radical. Shall we wipe the slate clean or shall we shall we try to fix what we have? Maybe we should wipe the slate clean and think about a system that I alluded to at the beginning of the session. What is it that we want to build that reflects us and the human rights that we talked about? And of course, the parties that are into business, they can still find good business models in this new dispensation. So I would like to believe that there's an opportunity, and there is precedence, like I said in the first day, uh, for models where things have been developed and shared for free. And 20, 30 years later, there are some interesting business models that come out of this. So really, I think we have a great opportunity, uh, as long as we ground this in the values that we talked about, uh, to make sure that we have a dispensation that works for everybody. Uh, the issue that I mentioned on the first day about indigenous knowledge, there is skepticism about some communities, about whether they should come to mainstream science. And I think we need to address those. Uh, because as uh, Professor Kajeta, if I remember properly, uh, talked about in terms of the work that is done over the years with indigenous communities, um, science as you know it is relatively new. Human beings have been looking into challenges regarding uh, uh, how they want to solve the for, for millennia. So it could be that let's think about a new dispensation where we engage genuinely with other knowledge systems and find out how, how to make it to the mainstream. And I think he had some good suggestions. Let's have those indigenous scientists come into the fore, uh, make sure that um, we have those centers of excellence that look at indigenous knowledge, 
countries develop legislation that acknowledges that there is indigenous knowledge and have intellectual property environments that also make sure that they don't look at mainstream science as skeptic, uh, with skepticism. And let's also make sure that we communicate with them properly. Uh, the issue of doing science in public health, doing research with human subjects, doing the publications and then glorifying ourselves, not necessarily communicating back to them, should be something of the past. So I think those would be my three main points on that point. Thank you very much. Thank you. And certainly that kind of a model fits in with the, 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 um, the mechanism that Kathleen is and her community are constructing in terms of having repositories and then the overlay, the opportunities for communities to form and do overlay on top. Uh, Mitu, um, any additional comments? I, well, I very much agree with, uh, with what has been said and the work of CORE, the work of AOSP, the work of colleagues in Latin America, certainly the leadership of UNESCO, all of that is absolutely critical and we do need to test, develop new models, test, test as much as we can, test this, the, the current system, push it, transform it the best we can. But today, right now, we cannot let the system as it is now and the current record of science as it is now unaddressed. We need policies for this. We need to transform the system as it stands now. And within that system, yes, you know, there are three or four major, major actors and publishers are one. It's going to be very difficult to uh, 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 ad adopt the policies that we need when it comes to uh, a data policy, for example, or uh, and, and other policies that, we, that have, has, have been mentioned without uh, engaging directly with, 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 the, the, with the publishers themselves. I, I guess that's what I, that's the, that's what I want, that's what I meant, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Any questions, um, Caitlin? Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, my name's Caitlin Thaney, I'm the Executive Director of Invest in Open Infrastructure. Um, and we spend a significant amount of time conducting research and also engaging with other um, individuals that are well represented in this room in terms of institutional contacts, funders, national agencies, consortia, uh, and really know that struggle in terms of coordination, which I think came up in all of the comments today. Um, and so, you know, I would love to hear a bit more, especially given the fact that we are looking at accelerating the pace of the work that's already underway and um, to your comment about needing to, you know, make sure that we're reforming where we are, not becoming complacent, if that's not putting words in your mouth. Um, but I would love in particular for Tiamo and Kathleen to maybe speak to some of the coordination efforts, um, both knowing that with Core Notify, you know, the, the partners that you have aligned there and that you're working with, it is, quite diverse, there's a lot of different cultural contexts. Um, Tiamo, I know, um, for example, with the ambitions of the African Open Science Platform, there's also initiatives like LibSense, the NRENS uh, in both Latin America and the African continent, and, and how you're thinking about constructively ensuring that you're sort of plugging those efforts in and building on um, areas of not only cultural context, but maybe efficiency um, in, in your work. Thank you. No, thank you very much uh, for the excellent question, giving me more time to speak on some of the issues that I couldn't speak on. Um, I was just maybe reminding Anathius I, I flew 16 hours to get here. So I should. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, th I, think, I think that's a wonderful question. You saw the, the slide I showed you with the various activities that have been happening in the continent. A very comprehensive landscape study was done. I, I, want, I want you to have a look at it, uh, detailing what's happening in the continent. It was very clear. There is no coordination. And without coordination, you cannot amplify impact. And you want to have that commonality of purpose, amplifying impact, that interactivity. So really, the African Open Science Platform is a science diplomacy platform that will be playing a coordinating role uh, to make sure that things don't fall through the cracks. I really enjoyed the citizen science presentation that was made earlier, hence my question uh, to, the author, to, the, to the presenter. And you saw the two points at the very end in my slide about the strategy of AOSP. Those two networks that we want to build to make sure that we have that connectivity in terms of coordination. And very critically, the operational model of AOSP will see us developing nodes 
in various regions of the continent, coordinated by the ASP coordinating hub at NRF. Uh, those nodes will be competent centers uh, looking at the various pillars of open science and of the ASP strategy. And there'll be cross fertilization uh, between the, the various activities and, and, and expertise uh, of those, those nodes. So I think it's a critical one because it's only through coordination that we can amplify the little investment that we have or the expertise that we have to propagate it uh, across the system. So I think that's, those would be two uh, critical points that I want to make. We also have a governing council uh, that we are currently formulating uh, that also allows us to have both uh, African representation in terms of the core uh, uh, oversight, but also uh, ex-official membership from other uh, uh, science systems very, very important for us to, to be able to plug into other dispensations. I mentioned earlier also the various open science platforms that have been developed. Um, there is a body a committee called OSCAR Roundtable that brings the executives of all these open science platforms to meet regularly. We are in the middle of developing a MOU uh, that will really in ca capture uh, how we intend to collaborate. And I think these are very important conduits to making sure that we have both continental uh, collaboration, uh, coordination, but also global. And I also mentioned the good work done by ASC Core Data in terms of GOSC, uh, where, where one will coordinate uh, globally so that things don't fall through the cracks. So really, I think that's what it's been lacking. There are pockets of excellence in the continent. Uh, we need to make sure those pockets can also address uh, 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 gaps elsewhere in the continent to make sure that we, we, we amplify impact. Thank you. Kathleen. Yeah, I mean, coordination is, is really challenging. And um, the way we approach that is really um, looking at where the funding comes from often, scientific funding, and that usually comes at the national level, but in Europe it comes regionally. Uh, uh, but so we, we often work through national um, organizations. Um, and what those national organizations can do is they can collaborate across stakeholder communities in their own country. So for example, we're working with the US repository network that has just recently been launched. And the US repository network, which is represented mainly by the library community at the moment, can work with the funders in the United States and can work with the local publishers and so on. So that's been really our approach to trying to tackle that really um, challenging um, uh, aspect of, of coordinating at the uh, international level. I know we're right up against time, and I do think one of the, the other things, um, as Kathleen was sort of drawing that example, there is the US repository network that works up through CORE that then works up through the, the, the funders. We actually coordinate closely with the International Science Council in their future of publishing work. So I think this notion of looking at how the different constituencies can be connected and where we can, you know, more intentionally build those channels and reinforce them is is critically important. Um, Mathieu, any last thing that you would like to add before I turn this over to our, our moderator? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much to all three of our panelists. We managed to wrap this one on time. So over to you. Thank you so much, Heather, and precisely on time. So, so thank you very much for your skill in, in leading the discussion and um, really interesting issues that were raised. And it's, it's really too bad that we're nearing the end of the third day because um, so many new perspectives keep coming and, and ideas. And it would be wonderful if we could take even more time to continue discussing.